Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good evening to all the viewers who are gathered today online for this wonderful webinar entitled Expert Talks from the organized by like IAP Emirates Neonatal Chapter and NMC Speciality Hospital. So myself, Taufik Ali, Country Business Manager of New Country Healthcare. Along with me is uh, Dr. Ahmad Alam, he's the business unit manager of Odessa. So today we will be having eminent speakers from US who will be talking on two different, two very important topics, Professor Edward Bill and Professor Jonathan Klein. So along with them, I have the IAP office bearers like uh, Dr. Uh, Raju PK, Dr. Sridhar Kalyan Sundaram, Dr. Karvendan Ramswami, and Dr. Khalid al Dr. Junaid Khan, and Dr. Ramesh Kumar as well. So to start with the proceedings, I would like to invite Dr. Raju PK to take over the session. Dr. Raju, please. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor, but we cannot see you, doctor. One minute. Yeah. Can you see me now? Yes, sir. Please. Is my voice voice clear? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is a very uh, exciting and uh, dynamic lecture you will hear today from Dr. Bell and Dr. Uh, Jonathan. It is a very uh, gray area of management of uh, newborns in, in intensive care. And I could get them today at short notice because I trained there in 1997. And this lecture will be quite comprehensive by Jonathan. And uh, please bear with us for the time of even one hour because it is extremely important for us to understand uh, the latest bundles of care offered by the university. Without much further ado, I will pass on the mic and invite my the president of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Dr. Ramesh Kumar, to give his inaugural address. Respected President of IAP Emirates Neonatology Chapter, Dr. Rajiv, Secretary, Dr. Sithar, guest faculty for the day, Professor Dr. Edward Bell, Dr. Jonathan Klein, our faculty, Dr. Khalid and Dr. Junaid, and Dr. Fadi, and my dear friend of IAP President of IAP Emirates, Dr. Sunny Kurian, all my friends who have logged in for the exciting session here today. Good evening from our side in India, UAE, and good morning to our friends on the other side of the world. I'm quite happy to be uh, involved with the, the expert talk series from the Neonatology chapter of Indian Academy of Pediatrics in UAE. And way back when the IAP Emirates was formed in uh, 2008, I believe, by Dr. Sunny Kurian and team. And it grew in leaps and bounds in this eventful 12 years in academic propagation through LHCMEs in the UAE. Dr. Sunny and team had their yearly CMEs in October every year and had a cream faculty from across the world. And in fact, Dr. Sunny was able to organize the his friends of the pediatric the friends in the pediatric fraternity of Indian origin under the umbrella of Indian Academy of Pediatrics and that was a great going. From there in 2018 October uh, when the, under the same in UAE only we had the Emirates chapter neonatology chapter formed with Rajiv PK taking up the initiative and it was with a mission to impart uh, high quality academic lectures and something like a stimulate research. So the expert talk e-library I learned as on YouTube, as I learned from Dr. Raju, it has reached around 10 high academic value CMEs and he has got a target to reach around 30 by Christmas time. And as today, uh, we have got one of the most innovative research units in USA with us. Dr. Edward Bell and Dr. Jonathan giving the keynote lecture on the management of extreme prematures below 30 to 23 weeks. Because for us, 
There's something about 24 weeks viable gestation. This is very viable um, in fence. So that's something could be innovative. And uh, the, the terminology also has a good proactive to philosophical Yawa approach. So there's uh, definitely uh, something in, in way, unique coming up for, for all of us. Uh, maybe a truly really a state of the art lecture, invaluable to all neonatal intensivists worldwide. And before concluding, my special regards to Dr. Sunny and Dr. Rajiv. And as I said, Dr. Sunny is a great friend for all of us in Indian Academy of Pediatrics out here. In, and he has organized, the, he has brought um, um, the IAP CMEs to the UAE under the umbrella of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And Dr. Rajiv, being one of the most senior neonatologists of India and a pioneer in all innovative care in India, like way back in 90s. Uh, from HFO, Viagra, Extreme from HFO Saravel. I've seen him working by the time of my post-graduation coming out. I've seen him coming out with a lot of uh, work on this. And his recently published textbook is also a landmark in natal history, something which I've seen. And as he has said, Dr. Bell is his teacher. So friends, um, I'm so happy and uh, proud to declare the CME officially inaugurated. And I wish the, the CME, the best of academics here uh, for all the viewers who have logged in and a wonderful session ahead from Dr. Bell and Dr. Clean. And in fact, we are quite thankful to Dr. Bell and Clean for joining us for the day. And thank you, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Sidhar, and all at Dr. Sunni and all at IAP UAE Neonatology chapter for the opportunity to represent Indian Academy of Pediatrics at this official outing. Thank you so much, JIAP. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Rajiv, please. I think we should move on with the introduction of uh, Dr. Bell by Dr. Khalid. Uh, very good evening, uh, dear uh, colleague, uh, dear faculty, uh, dear attendees. Uh, um, very good morning to our uh, eminent speaker, which I'm uh, really proud to uh, be one of the uh, moderator of this very uh, scientific evening. Uh, I would like to thank the faculty for inviting me to share this uh, session with my colleague, uh, Dr. Junaid Khan. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, such an eminent uh, speaker, such as Dr. Bell. Dr. Bell received his MD from Columbia University, completed his residency in pediatrics at Columbia, and fellowship in neonatology at McMaster University and Brown University. He is the professor of pediatrics at University uh, of Loa. Uh, he was the director of neonatology at the University of Loa from 1988 until 2005. And since then, he had served as a vice chair for the faculty development in the Department of Pediatrics. Throughout his career, he has conducted clinical and trans translational research related to the care of prematurity uh, or prematurely born infants. His he is the principal investigator of the University of Loa Center in the uh, NICHD and Unita Research Network. Dr. Bell and his colleague at the University of Loa had been leaders in the management of infant of the limit of viability and their outcome for infant born at 22 and 23 weeks of gestation are among the best in the world. He developed and maintains the tiniest baby registry, a web-based registry for surviving infant who weighed less than 400 gram at birth. Dr. Bell is one of the pioneers of newborn intensive care in United States, and has been researching in neonatal nutrition for over three decades with more than 350 research publications. He is the author of the chapter Nutrition in the main textbook, Assisted Ventilation in UNATE by Goldsmiths and Karotkins from 1989. Dr. Bell will be giving us a talk about the Tiny Baby Consortium. So welcome, Dr. Bell, and 
let's see the science in this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Al-Tawi. <clears throat> Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this uh, in this webinar, and I want to thank Dr. Rajiv for inviting me. Uh, I've never <laughs> visited uh, Dubai, uh, and I want to thank uh, Zoom for making this possible for me to be there with you today. Uh, my uh, my main purpose for being here today is to uh, is to introduce Professor Klein and the topic of uh, 22 and 23 week infants, but Dr. Rajiv asked me to say a few words about the Tiniest Babies Registry, which has been an interest of mine for the past 20 years. <clears throat> uh, here's the homepage for the Tiniest Babies Registry. If you, if you would like to uh, investigate this, uh, the easiest way to find it is simply to enter Tiniest Babies Registry into Google. Dr. <clears throat> Bell, we so, cannot see your screen. He oh. has to share the screen. Uh, Taufiq, he didn't share the yeah. screen. Yeah. Uh, let me try it again. Are you seeing it yet? Yes, doctor. Please proceed. Okay, you have it now? Yes, Doctor. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> this is the homepage for the Tiniest Babies Registry. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that I started in 2000. My interest in this actually began in 1994 <clears throat> when we had our first uh, under 400 gram baby at the University of Iowa. Uh, <clears throat> and the parents asked me, are there other babies? <clears throat> are there other babies as small? That have survived, and I said, "Well, I I know of one that I read about in uh, in a magazine, and uh, I'll start to see what I can find." And so I began to collect these babies from the uh, medical literature and from uh, lay publications. And in 2000, I began the registry with 15 babies. Uh, the easiest way to find this is to Google Tiniest Babies Registry. Uh, as of today, there are 274 infants in the registry. Their birth weights range from 230 grams to 399. There are 40 infants with birth weights below 300 grams. Their gestational ages range from 21 to 34 weeks. We have two infants with gestational ages of 21 weeks. <clears throat> At least one of those was an IVF uh, infant, so we know that the gestational age is accurate. It was 21 and six days. Of course, um, nearly all of these infants are small for gestational age because to be uh, 400 grams and appropriately grown, you would be uh, 19 or 20 weeks. And so uh, these uh, are all babies who are uh, undergrown and 69% uh, of them are girls uh, because girls mature more quickly than boys in utero. And so the, as, uh, as you all know, females uh, have a survival advantage uh, at extreme premature birth. Uh, here you can see the gestational age distribution of the babies in the registry. Uh, most of these babies are between 22 and 26 weeks. Uh, there you can see the 134 week baby way out there. That baby was born in the 1930s, <clears throat> um, but most of them um, are uh, 22 through 26 or 27 weeks. Here you can see the distribution by year of birth. <clears throat> Very uh, peculiarly, there were three babies I found born in the 1930s. Uh, these were all severely undergrown babies. They were born in three different countries in three different years. And then there was a 50 year gap 
with no babies reported until the 1980s. And now you can see they're coming um, more often. Here are the countries of birth. Uh, the United States uh, has the largest number, but Germany and Japan have uh, large numbers. I think there are quite a few more Japanese babies that haven't made it into the registry yet, but there is scattering of other countries, uh, mostly in Europe, uh, but a few uh, in other places. <clears throat> no babies from India yet, none from uh, the Emirates. Uh, this baby, uh, baby Sabi, was born in California in 2019 and was, at the time, uh, the smallest baby in the registry. Uh, 245 grams. Uh, but since then, we've uh, she's uh, been surpassed by three babies from the University of Cologne <clears throat> that uh, weighed less than 245. The smallest baby now is a is a male baby who weighed 230. Uh, the University of Cologne has four of the 10 smallest babies. Uh, they do remarkable things there. I, I believe that their uh, results are true and they're Weights are accurate because one of my colleagues has visited them and they do, uh, they do quite amazing work there. You can see now that of the 10 smallest babies, five are male and uh, uh, Germany has uh, six of the 10 smallest babies. Only two of these are uh, from the US. So this was, uh, this was about the the birth weight limit of viability. Uh, now I'm gonna move briefly to talking about the gestational age limit of viability. And I've been working in this field now for uh, more than 40 years. And uh, over the course of my career uh, in the United States, the gestational age limit of viability has, has dropped by about one week every decade <clears throat> and to the point where we're now at uh, 22 weeks. And uh, this has been uh, an amazing phenomenon to me. Uh, each time we've reached another limit, we thought we would never see any further movement. And uh, in the 1990s, I did an interview with the New York Times and said 24 weeks has to be the absolute limit, as I guess it is in India now, because of the uh, biology, uh, the physical distance from the alveolus to the airway is such that we can't possibly have gas exchange any earlier. But of course, we've, uh, as Dr. Klein will explain to you later, uh, we've now seen some advances beyond this because of the, uh, the, the wonders of anti-neocorticosteroids and the, and the biologic variability. Uh, so how do we know when it's time to start treating younger babies? Uh, and what I've told my colleagues from time to time is that you have to push the wall to see whether it will move. <clears throat> now, uh, we have good survival at 22 weeks at the University of Iowa, but this is not the only place in the world where this uh, is occurring. Uh, here you can see some uh, results from recent publications around the world uh, <clears throat> from the years 2012 to 2016. Uh, in the United States, this is the Vermont Oxford Network. 9% uh, of live births at 22 weeks survive, and 29% and of babies admitted to the NICU survived to hospital discharge. In the Japanese neonatal network, so this is a national cohort, 46% of live births survived, and 51% of babies admitted to the NICU <clears throat> during these years, 2008 to 2012 and the results are um, better nowadays. In a, in a Swedish national cohort, 30% uh, of live births at 22 weeks and 58% of NICU admissions survive to one year of age. And if we look at particular hospitals, the, the University of Cologne, 61% uh, of the of 22 week babies admitted to the hospital survived to discharge at the University of Uppsala, 52% at the University of Iowa during a particular 10-year interval, we had 70% survival uh, at 22 weeks. Um, and you can see that uh, in certain hospitals, 
over 50% of live births survive to discharge. Uh, Professor Klein will tell you that this number hasn't held up over a longer interval, but still we have over 50% survival of, uh, of live person admissions uh, at the University of Iowa. So this is to show you that it's not just uh, at, uh, at the University of Iowa, but there are selected places around the world where we're seeing uh, these uh, high survival rates of 22 weeks. So this is the, the main theme of today's uh, webinar is the management and outcomes of peri-viable infants born at 22 and 23 weeks uh, with, a, uh, with a positive proactive philosophical approach, the Iowa way. And uh, Professor Klein is gonna spend some time telling you how we do it at Iowa and how we've achieved these results. Now, uh, Professor Jonathan Klein uh, joined the University of Iowa faculty in 1990, uh, two years after I became the dire uh, director of the Division of Neonatology, and uh, he was one of the first faculty members I recruited to our division, and uh, the most important uh, recruitment that I made during my years as uh, leader of the division there. Uh, and uh, 15 years later, uh, shortly before I stepped down as division director, I appointed John as medical director of the, of the ICU. And this was also a very important appointment that I made. Um, John has won awards for his teaching, for his clinical service, and for his research. He's been uh, in the uh, best doctors in America since 1998. He's conducted research on lung development and pulmonary management. Early in his faculty career, he ran a basic science lab uh, studying uh, fetal and neonatal lung development, uh, particular the, the role of uh, EGF receptor in lung development, uh, and then subsequently uh, moved his research to studying aspects of, um, studying clinical and translational aspects of um, lung management in the infant. Um, John is especially well known for his research and expertise in high frequency ventilation, as Dr. Rajiv said, and uh, application of novel ventilation strategies. And he's uh, frequently consulted uh, from uh, neonatologists and from units around the world uh, for uh, help with management of particularly challenging patients. Uh, recently, because of our units, Excellent outcomes. Professor Klein has been in high demand as a speaker for advice on management of infants born near the limit of viability. And uh, thanks to the COVID pandemic, he's been able to um, to give talks uh, at many places that, that haven't required uh, traveling quite so far. And he's done many of these virtual presentations. Uh, John has unique personal qualities that have made him very effective in his role as our medical director um, and, uh, and a leader in the field. He understands the physiology uh, of uh, neonatal intensive care and can explain it in easily understood terms. He has great clinical instincts, but also uses evidence to guide practice. Uh, his clinical leadership is respected by all and so he's able to build consensus, which is critically important uh, when, you, when you lead uh, a multidisciplinary group in a highly stressful place like a neonatal intensive care unit. He's able to develop practice guidelines and get others to follow them. So that we have a uniform approach to most aspects of practice, which is critically important to our good outcomes. Although the team is essential, its leader is really the key element and Professor Klein develops a huge portion of credit for our excellent outcomes. So I am happy to introduce Professor Klein and uh, turn over the program.
Dr. Junaid. Yes. Yes. I'm here. Yes, Dr. So, Dr. Kiddings. Okay. So, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Without further ado, because uh, Professor Edward Bell already um, introduced Dr. Uh, uh, Klein. Uh, so, I just don't have to uh, further elaborate uh, because, believe me, the CV which I receive, it is a short CV and it is about uh, 35 pages. So, I think. Uh, it is a very comprehensive uh, work uh, did by uh, Professor Klein uh, in the field of uh, neonatology. Uh, Professor Klein uh, uh, recorded his uh, degree from John Hopkins University. He has a cert board certification since 1985 uh, in pediatrics and neonatal uh, uh, perinatal medicine. He, uh, as Dr. Bell said, he has a lot of professional and academic positions held. And he has at least uh, 15 awards and honors uh, another 15 to 20 honors. His teaching uh, assignment, uh, I can count here is more than uh, 190 or 200 approximately in his CV. And same the amount of publication he did. So really, uh, it's our uh, great honor for me to uh, say, introduce uh, Professor Jonathan Klein. And we will continue what Dr. Uh, Edward Bell started, that uh, how to deal with these micro premi. Uh, really, it is a very, very um, hot topic nowadays. And here also the limit of the viability we are reaching 24 to 23, but less than 23 is a still a challenge in uh, our area. So without further ado, uh, Professor Jonathan Bell, uh, Professor Jonathan Klein, uh, you are there. I hope he's there. Over to you, sir, over to you. All right, thank you very much um, for this invitation <clears throat> to speak at the, um, Emirates and, and worldwide regarding this interesting uh, topic. So I'm gonna work on sharing my screen now. Okay, just double checking, can people see the screen? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Okay. We can see. Yeah, we can see. All right, fantastic. So I'm gonna talk about um, what I call beyond extreme prematurity the management and outcomes of periviable infants born at 22 to 23 weeks gestation. And it's important to include this concept of a positive proactive philosophical approach because there actually has to be a cultural change when you're trying to overcome this concept of caring for babies below what's considered the, the limit of viability, which had always been thought to be 24 weeks gestation. And I'm just showing here on the, uh, First slide, this, these are two babies born at uh, twins, 22 and one seven of the week gestation, twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Um, this is the recipient twin at 490, the donor twin at 449. And uh, this is them home. And actually they're gonna become uh, two years old uh, on Tuesday. Um, again, I have nothing to disclose other than this mother was very social media savvy and she researched this and talked to the Guinness Book of World Records. So in the Guinness Book of World Records, they're gonna be in the most recent uh, website and publication since at least at this point in time, they're the, not the smallest, but they're the most premature twins with both twins uh, surviving. So the objectives of this study are this presentation are threefold. One is to describe the culture and philosophy of a NICU dedicated to caring for infants born at 22 to 23 weeks gestation. There has to be a, the whole culture of the unit has to be expecting these babies to survive, otherwise they will not. Uh, number two, I wanna go over the survival morbidity, which is critical, and the two-year outcomes, which is very critical. 
for periviable infants born at 22 to 23 weeks gestation. Now, granted, this is a single center and with a proactive philosophical approach. And thirdly, I wanna to try to identify differences and why we do these differences in management strategies when caring for infants born at this uh, periviable 22 to 23 weeks gestation uh, period of time. So I always think about caring for 22 week uh, babies similar to the Apollo moon landing um, over 50 years ago. And that was felt to be many people would felt that it would be impossible to be able to launch from earth and put men on the moon. And obviously it was possible, but it was hard and it was incredibly difficult. And the key thing with uh, going from earth to the moon isn't really the three men here, um, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin, but in reality, it was the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people comprising the team that accomplished this. And the concept of a team approach is tremendously critical to survival at a 22 weeks uh, gestation. Now, this is just a thought question here. And if I ask people, what is the mean survival of all live born 22 week gestation infants that was recorded by the Vermont Oxford Network, which is 1200 NICUs. Um, and I'm looking at the most advanced NICUs, which are type C level three, four units in 2018 just theoretically, what would one think the, the survival was? And at that point, it was 14%. So you could say that survival of 22 weeks is you know, near impossible if this is what's being reported through most of the units. So the question is, how can we get survival beyond that? And part of that is I've always, oops, part of that, is that um, I okay? Is my video working? Or is, yes. Yeah. No, we can see you, doctor. Okay. Sorry. Um, part of that is looking at how man made it from Earth to the Moon, and I can't read the Latin here, but the translation is achieved through excellence. And looking at their mission statements. There are two things that I pulled out that I thought were very relevant for the care of 22 weekers. One is competence, there being no substitute for total preparation and complete dedication for space, or for us, the NICU will not tolerate the careless or indifferent. And it takes a lot of situational awareness for us not to fall into carelessness and a huge amount of compassion for us not to be indifferent. It's very easy to say, that, oh, this is a peri-viable baby, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the next huge thing, which is really difficult, is teamwork. Respecting and utilizing the ability of others, realizing that we work toward a common goal, for success depends on the efforts of all. And this is super critical. Uh, there are a lot of times these babies are alive because not something that I or another physician did, but it was us listening to what the nurses nurse practitioners, actually the parents tell us. So many times we would detect uh, late onset sepsis because a nurse or nurse practitioner or a resident or fellow would say, gee, the glucose level is a little bit, it's normal, but it's a little bit lower than expected in this baby, or the glucose is actually a little bit higher than expected, but still normal. And they went ahead and evaluated those babies for infection and both those babies end up growing E. coli. And because we recognized it before there was cardio respiratory instability, those babies survived and did well. And that included those, uh, the pair of twins I showed you at the beginning. Uh, one of those was saved because the nurse practitioner recognized that a normal but low glucose was unexpected and could be a sign of infection. Um, in fact, even we've had other babies where the mother said, I don't think the baby just is looking the normal level and we investigated infection, worked that baby up and started antibiotics and that again, saved that baby's life. So it's important to respect and utilize the ability of everyone, including um, all healthcare workers, as well as the family. And the next major thing is to recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but that in trying, we did not give it our best effort. So it takes a huge amount of energy in the first two weeks of caring for a 22-weeker. I consider the transition period of a term baby 
four hours. A transition period of a 22, 23 weeker is really 14 days. So there's a lot of intensity that ha and a lot of exams and a lot of, you know, a little bit more labs than you would normally expect and fine tuning that is necessary to prevent a problems from occurring. A lot of times once the problems have occurred, it becomes too late. Um, our overall philosophy is that we expect these infants to survive and thrive. So not just that they're gonna live, but they're gonna go on to do well. And we know this is very hard. It's very difficult, but it's clearly not impossible. And these are three recent uh, survivors. This is a 22 and one seventh week, 488 gram baby. Came from another center that said they can't care for 22 weekers, came to Iowa. And this baby was so gelatinous and translucent when I, I was present during this baby's resuscitation birth, we just watched the, um, after intubation, the heart rate came up and wasn't so much hearing it or looking at the monitor, you could actually see the heart beating through the chest. This is her at age five. This is another 22 and two seventh weaker. So uh, 379 grams. So it could fit in the tiniest baby's registry and um, sailed through no problems. This is the male. This was a 22 and six seventh weaker, 465 grams, uh, had pulmonary hypoplasia, difficult resuscitation, did not actually have a heart rate over 100 or CO2 that was recordable until got put on high frequency ventilation, did have NEC, recovered from that, did have uh, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, did not need to be shunted, um, but does have some long term seizure problems. So this gives a sense that, you know, Two thirds of these kids actually do quite well. One third do have some um, issues long term, but it's not hopeless in any way. So now, if I asked you what the mean survival of all live born 22 week infants at the University of Iowa over a long cumulative time, and we do a long cumulative time here, 2006 to 2019, because there's not a lot of these babies born per year. So you want to not be fooled by the tyranny of small numbers. And so obviously the answer is gonna be 58% and that's all live born. Um, if I compare that to some more recent data from the 2019 type C or level three, four NICUs, the median survival, because many hospitals won't try, is 0% with an interquartile range up to 22.2%. So let's look at additionally, some more philosophical differences and how they impact our care. This is a paper um, by one of our fellows back when he was a medical student. It was published in 2015. And he showed that the rates of active treatment accounted for 78% of hospital variation in survival at 22 or 23 weeks, but only 22% at 24 weeks. But more importantly, the rates of active treatment did not account for any variation in outcomes at 25 or 26 weeks. So there's certainly things that we do differently that greatly affect outcome. So the point is differences in hospital rates of active treatment, obviously you have to decide to treat, but you have to know how to treat, do not count for all variation in outcomes. In particular, in hospitals that make the decision to treat all babies at 24 weeks, risk adjusted survival varied from 42 to uh, 70%. So uh, very significant differences. So therefore factors other than just the decision to resuscitate contribute heavily to the variation in outcomes. And again, that's what will be a part of the middle of this talk. Um, importantly, hospitals at which active treatment was more often initiated had higher rates of risk adjusted survival than did hospitals which active treatment was less frequently initiated. So as you start to care for younger babies, your outcomes of your more mature babies uh, improve. Now, is this a huge problem to make a decision to care at 22 and 23 weeks? And at least use, looking at the United States, it's really not gonna overwhelm your NICUs. There's roughly 4 million births in the US. There were only roughly about 2,022 weekers that were live born and 3,023 weekers. So no individual NICU should be getting massively overwhelmed, at least in the United States. Um, this is an example. This is a 23 and 6 seventh week twin um, who's now 10 years old. And the important thing with this twin is that his sister was born a week earlier and the family asked us not to intervene, which we it's the family's decision. So we did not, but we did, you know, um, they were willing for us to attempt resuscitation. And they actually felt from their interpretation of the literature, the 
father was a physician that 23 weekers could not survive and back then and would do poorly. And actually the child is quite intelligent and doing extremely well in, in school. So this is the table that our uh, teams use when counseling families at the cusp of viability. So this is again, number of all live born infants, even if we don't resuscitate. So I'm being unfair to neonatologists because I wanna be fair to the obstetricians where sometimes they say, well, you cherry pick that you'll go back for a 22 weeker. If they're vigorous, you'll take the baby to the NICU. If they need resuscitation, you won't. So this includes everyone. If I look at babies for neonatologists that we actually bring to the NICU that the parents ask us to resuscitate survival cumulatively since 2006 through 2019 is at 63%. Um, 23 weekers where basically all families have asked us to resuscitate except for one, we have 74% survival. And in the US at 24 weeks, we automatically do resuscitate all 24 weekers and our survival over again, a very long period of time is at 85%. Now, this is a, a day um, almost uh, two years ago where if you looked at babies at many centers would consider peri viable, we had at that time um, 10, 22 and 23 weekers. And I'm showing the birth weights because all these babies basically were AGA for their gestational ages. At 22 weeks, basically AGA is between 400 and um, close to 600 grams. So that these aren't LGA babies that we're saying are 22 weeks. These are AGA 22 weekers between 10th and 90th percentile for the most part. Um, the other thing that's important to look at here is unfortunately out of these five 22 weekers, two did succumb and did not live um, to discharge. Now, one thing is Dr. Bell uh, brilliantly pointed out that there's, that Iowa is not the only place that is having survival, what people would consider pre-viable, peri-viable babies at 22 weeks. This would be the Iowa survival here, Cologne, Germany, um, this is a Japanese neonatal research network, and this is one of the Sweden's, Sweden's collaborative units. So you can see most, most of these centers are having survival close to 50%. And again, these are the two uh, nationwide networks in the United States. And obviously as expected, when you go to 22 to 23, survival jumps up everywhere. And again, Iowa, Cologne, Germany, Japan, and Sweden have very high survival at, at, at 23, as well as a very good survival at 22 weeks. So this can be done. It's nothing specifically you know, unique to the state of Iowa. There are ways that this is being brought about by other centers. And when you look at these other centers, their approaches all tend to to be very detailed, very obsessive compulsive, paying huge attention to details and focus on minimizing value trauma. And I'll talk more about our approach to minimizing that. Okay. The other thing I wanna show is that um, there's always concern that what if all four, you know, what, you know, is Sweden and Japan and Cologne, Germany, Iowa, are we all not dating uh, pregnancy correctly. And I would say, obviously, we are dating it correctly, similar to everywhere else. But I also want to show based on birth weight, eliminating the question of the of, of pregnancy dating. And so if you look at less than 501 grams, again, this is the median number in 2019 for the Vermont Oxford Network level three, four type C NICUs. And our survival below 501 is about 55%. And you can see this is 22%. Um, there are some centers that will not resuscitate below 500 grams. So if I looked at 501 to 750 gram survival, you, and I switched this um, to mortality, the mortality here would be about 12%. The mortality here is about 32%. So at this 501 to 750 gram population, I think some of the things that we're doing, you know, reduce mortality about 250% less mortality. So let's let's talk about what, what are we doing at Iowa and how can this be translated 
and transmitted for other centers to think about if you want to work on 23 and 22 weekers. And so it's important to have what I call a small baby system. Uh, when I came to University of Iowa, Dr. Bell basically already had that in place. We had a unit at that time of about 11 beds where all babies less than 30 weeks um, were admitted and that you had well-trained nurses for that population and had a, had a team just dedicated to that population. And we've continued pushing that forward for the, for the next 30 years. So it's important to have a dedicated, integrated structure and culture for extremely premature infants. The system is the star. And the system are all these people here. This is not the neonatologist. This is the baby and the family. They're here. The neonatologist is just one of the huge members of this team. So currently we have what we call our, our Bay One or neonatal critical care unit. This is a separate dedicated unit of 14 beds. Um, we admit all babies less than 28 weeks are admitted here as well as the most critically ill term infants. So it's not just a small baby unit, but it's a very intense area so that the nurses get experience managing the cardiopulmonary challenges of diaphragmatic hernias as well as 22 week uh, babies. Um, there's a separate nursing staff that basically just staffs here. It's hard for a nurse to get good at caring for babies who do not have keratinized skin. If they care for one 22 weeker uh, every two years, it's better for them to caring for multiple 22 and 23 weekers every month so they get the experience. Um, it's a separate location. It's the closest area of our unit to labor and delivery. So most of these tiny babies, their 10 minute APGAR is done in the NICU. They're already on a jet ventilator at that point. We have a separate critical care lab just for the NICU. So we're not waiting 45 minutes to get a blood gas or glucose result. And importantly, there's a separate medical team that focuses on just these 12 to 13 patients you have to spend a lot of time fine tuning at 22 and 23 weeks. You can't get overwhelmed having to run on another 20 patients who are not, who are relatively stable and doing discharge planning. You have to really spend a lot of time focused on titrating the care on these patients, especially in the first two weeks of life. So we have a separate attending service. I might call them needed intensivists. We have a fellow nurse practitioners, residents, dietitians, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, that, that basically round on this population so we get input from all the subspecialties at once. Um, currently NICU um, at Iowa is 84 rooms with 88 beds. Um, this is an older photograph, but what it's showing is that the, this is the area of the unit that we'll admit the small babies into. And you can see we're right next to where all the babies are delivered here in the green. So it's very easy, you know, the baby will be born, stabilized, five minute APGAR is done, baby is shown to the mom and brought back uh, to the NICU to be placed on high frequency. This is just another um, example of a, another twin that was 22 and six months week, 395 grams. Uh, these are inches, not centimeters. Um, and this was taken by uh, one of my colleagues, when he joined, he also was unbelieving. And then I said, just if you follow our guidelines, you'll see things will come out well, for the most part. Um, so, what is, so what are some of the guidelines that are really important for this to occur? So this starts before the babies are, are born. Um, the, you have to have interdisciplinary teamwork with maternal fetal medicine, with the obstetricians and the if the obstetricians aren't on board with using antenatal steroids, this does not succeed. Um, antenatal steroids, there's a lot of literature on this, between 22 and 25 weeks gestation reduces death, reduces severe IVH, reduces the incidence of nerve development impairment 18 to 22 months. And importantly for why I'm talking about this, it increases survival from 18% to 39% at 22 weeks gestation. So it doubles survival. This is from this paper down here, published in 2018 by Aret et al. And, and uh, the JAMA Network Open. And that is one of the de definitive papers that showed that steroids statistically make a significant difference. And it's 
one of the key things. If the OBs are not using antenatal steroids, it gets very difficult to have high survival at 22 weeks. And this has been studied um, for a long time. Now, there's never been enough 22 weekers to enroll in a randomized control trial. So the randomized control trials obviously were 24 weeks and above with having adequate numbers. But when people went back and reviewed over the past 10 years, lots of data, they're showing here, there's three papers from 20, I'm sorry, two papers from 2011, two papers from 2016, and two papers from 2018, showing the important impact of antenatal steroids. Now, one of the things with antenatal steroid therapy, certainly we all know it works ab above 20, greater or equal to 24 weeks. Improves lung maturity, again, reduces RDS, NEC, severe IVH and mortality. So shouldn't everyone be giving it? And unfortunately, everyone is not giving it to, to mothers that are at risk of this delivery. You can see here, again, the Vermont Oxford Network data, median data, and the difference between Iowa and the Vermont, Network, Vermont Oxford Network which is again, like I said, over um, 1,100, 1,200 NICUs actually worldwide now. And you can say Iowa has always been very good at over 90% antenatal steroids in the 22 to 33 week population. And the Vermont Oxford Network used to be in the 80s and over 15 years, they're now 90s, but still needs to get higher. And so if we look at the infants where the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology definitively say you should be giving any of steroids. I was 99%. And there are places that aren't reaching that high since the median number is only 93%. And including the 22 and 23 weekers, I was at close to 98% and the bonds 91%. So this is a key difference. Any of steroids are critical. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit more about this. You know, at 22 weeks, people want to know about the Iowa population. It is true that it's about 74% uh, white Caucasian, but it is 26% um, Hispanic or black. So it's not just, you know, hardy Swedish farm, farmer, farm babies. Now, the next important thing here is there's a concern that you give any of steroids and you must do a C-section, you must do fetal monitoring. And so we've always separated those concepts. Um, it's not our job to have, do OB's job. So we've just asked them to give the antenatal steroids. So if this baby who's in labor at 22 weeks is gonna go on to deliver, we've matured all of the physiologic systems using antenatal steroids. And we know that actually starts to kick in with, within 12 hours. We don't get upset if, the, if they give the antenatal steroids and the baby delivers five minutes later, they did their best. And they don't get upset if they give antenatal steroids and the baby doesn't deliver for weeks, well, then you don't have a 22 weeker, then you might have a 24 or 25 weeker, and in which case they would do a rescue course of steroids if the mom goes back into labor. So we do not, we don't do any fetal monitoring at 22 weeks and they don't do C-sections. Now, since this data was generated, our OBs have done two C-sections for maternal reasons for two 22 weekers both moms and the babies have survived in our, in our home. And as you can see, once we jump past that 22 week uh, divider, 49% of the 23 weekers have had C-sections and 75% of the 24 weekers have had C-sections. The other important thing, which again goes what I showed you at the very beginning with those set of twins, is that half of babies at 22 weeks are multiples and only half are singletons. And that is one explanation for why they're going into labor at 22 weeks. And as you can see, singletons go up to 75% at 23 weeks, so multiples are only 25%. And by 24 weeks, 83% of those babies are singletons and only 17% are multiples. So multiples play a large role. And you'll see as, a as I go through this, many of our 22 weekers are, were twins. Um, the other thing here is I want to show you is chorioamnitis. A lot of these times, why are they being born at 22 weeks? It's because of preterm prolonged rupture of membranes. And that then is a setup for chorioamnitis. So unfortunately, chorioamnitis is a huge risk. We saw in this, this cohort, about 20% of these babies had chorio. And as I'll talk later, that's a big impact on uh, survival. So what's another difference? 
Um, one of the other differences that I think is, you know, everyone wants to minimize hypoxia and hyperoxia during resuscitation. So we have a delivery room oximeter protocol. This is a table that sits in the delivery room when 30 years ago, you know, 35 years ago, when I was a resident, the goal was have the, having the baby blindingly glowing um, within minute of delivery. And that's not the process anymore. The process to get, is to get to that blindingly glowing baby by 10 minutes of life, not by one minute of life. Now we initiate resuscitation with oxygen. We don't initiate with room air and we don't use 30% oxygen. We've always started with 50% and we titrate per the saturation per the saturation protocol. And, I, and why, do you, why do we start with this level of oxygen? And what we always believe, we know these babies are gonna have VQ mismatch. We know the lungs are poorly developed. We know we need to you know, get enough oxygen in so that the heart is gonna be responding. And what's interesting, we've done this forever, is that there was this brilliant study um, from this team out of, out of Sweden that looked at targeted oxygen and the resuscitation of preterm, it's a randomized clinical trial. So brilliant work here, published in 2017. You read deeply into the paper, and you find this really interesting fact that in the population we're talking about, which is obviously the extremely pre preterm population, if you look at mortality, if you, if you used room air, your mortality was very high, 22%. And if you're associated with 100% oxygen, it cut mortality almost fourfold down to 6%. Now, I don't think you need to use 100% oxygen to resuscitate below 28 weeks since we've spent you know, many decades after decades using 50% and, and uh, actually many of those babies we end up weaning um, since they respond quite well to that. But I think resuscitating with less than 50% is gonna impact the ability to have those patients to survive. I do know that when we did have some people that were not following this and were using 30%, those babies unfortunately ended up passing away within the first week of life from acute pulmonary hypertension, which is a problem at 22 weeks with pulmonary hypoplasia and preterm pro prolonged rupture of membranes. So this is one thing that's done differently. Um, another thing we wanna think about is when we deal with the embryology, the periviable lungs, I mean, how is it possible to survive without a VLI? you know, because these babies are being born during this fetal period and basically born during the canalicular phase. And really you don't have much of VLI and hopefully you do have some of the alveolar saccules. So the concept is you have terminal bronchioles as you're developing branch to respiratory bronchioles. Next stage, you branch to alveolar ducts. Now, now the interesting thing is alveolar ducts, when they terminate it, they tip into alveolar sac and alveolar sac allows gas exchange to occur. The alveolar sac is thin wall and vascularized. So we can exchange CO2 and get oxygen in. And that starts to happen at 24 to 27 weeks. It doesn't really happen theoretically before 24 weeks. But when people looked at autopsies, they could find that the cranial segments of the lung mature faster than the caudal segments. So the entire lung does not undergo lung development in a homogeneous fashion. So you do have a few areas of lung that are now mature enough to survive even at 22 weeks gestation. But the key is don't damage the lung. And um, that's the key. So two main things, you need the antenatal steroids, which helps to accelerate this maturation process. And key, it helps to thin out the mesenchyme so gas exchange can occur. And then you need a lung protective strategy. You need to minimize the volume trauma. So, we tried to do a very developmental pathophysiologic approach. We want to not have pneumothorax and we certainly do not want to have PIE. PIE, pulmonary interstitial emphysema, usually occurs when you're at the canalicular stage of lung development with high free, at the canalicular stage of lung development. So here at this 22 to 24 weeks, we have respiratory bronchioles. We have some then leading to these alveolar ducts. And the place that the rupture occurs is really not at the alveolar sac, since it tends to be pretty stiff, it actually occurs at the cuff here of the rest of the uh, respiratory bronchioles and that leads to the pulmonary interstitial emphysema. So at the canalicular stage of lung development, it's critically important to avoid shear force injury as we all talk about it as value trauma. So we are a first intention high frequency center. 
we've been first attention for a um, very long time. And so the current, you know, we've gone through many different high frequency devices um, over, and certainly I've been using high frequency um, since 1987. So 33 years, gone through many different devices. And the current device that we're using right now is the, the jet ventilator. Um, certainly all high frequency devices when used correctly can help minimize value trauma. So we are jet ventilations basically used definitely on all babies less than 26 weeks. And pretty much I've gotten the teams using it on all, all babies that need intubation below um, 27 weeks now. So talk, I'll just talk a little bit about the JET since that's our primary approach for right now. The, the, the JET, the, the data here shows that JET ventilation increases healing of pulmonary interstitial emphysema. JET ventilation, high frequency JET ventilation reduces incidence of air leaks. High frequency JET ventilation improves survival of, of neonates and pneumothorax or PIE. That was again, brilliant work here by um, Martin Kessler back in 1991. And another brilliant paper by Martin Kessler, which was uh, back in 1997, showed importantly, high frequency jet ventilation reduced incidence of BPD in infants with RDS treated with surfactant. So the key is the anti value trauma approach with a well understood how to use the mechanism of jet ventilation uh, optimally, which is a challenge because it's not just a drug. So you have to have understand how to use all high frequency ventilators correctly because the management of this device impacts the outcome. Okay. Now, another thing that we do differently at Iowa, uh, all centers will use surfactant therapy initially for RDS. So this is a paper we published a long time ago in 2006. And this respiratory severity score basically is FiO2 uh, times mean airway pressure. And as you go higher, it's a, a good way to look at lung, lung illness. And you, you start with two populations at birth, one that are intubated just because they needed it for neonatal resuscitation. Um, and another group are intubated and actually have RDS. So this is the group that gets surfactant. And the fascinating thing is this group splits by about a, a week of life, about seven days of age into a group that has what we call post-surfactant slump and another group that doesn't have post-surfactant slump. These are babies that still require to be on the ventilator. And the post-surfactant slump group is the, this population that goes on used often to die either acutely or late from severe respiratory failure, either severe RDS or severe BPD. And we find as they're worsening between day 10 and 14, we can prevent this worsening with a repeat course of surfactant. Now it's important to make sure that this worsening isn't due to pulmonary edema from congestive heart failure from a hemodynamically significant PDA. So obviously if this is due to a hemodynamically significant PDA, you'll treat the PDA first. The PDA shunt is no longer a problem and they're not better. Now you give the repeat surfactant. Um, this is not, this is only done, we found that's only 20% of babies under a thousand grams of RDS who progress here. So when they did the randomized controlled trials of, of late surfactant, they didn't find a difference because they gave it to all babies still on the ventilator and eight out of 10 of those babies did not have a need for that. So most of the babies in the late surfactant, repeat surfactant trials, the respiratory severity index were almost always less than four. And again, we're treating the ones that are, are above four. And again, that's only 20% of that population. So when we do this, we find it's really only 20% of infants less than 1,000 grams of RDS actually develop post surfactant slump after day of life six. We always want to rule out that it's not due to a hemodynamic significant duct. We found that over 70% of infants had an improvement with the treatment. And you can predict who was actually going to develop this because if you needed more, two or more doses of initial surfactant, um, it was very predictive, a 2.4 fold increased risk of needing this. And it, once again, the brilliance of having multidisciplinary teamwork with our obstetricians is that antenatal steroids reduce the risk of developing it by almost 80%. And 
either of these drugs, Infosurf or CureSurf, did help with post-surfactant uh, slump. Okay, so that that um, was one another difference. So another controversial difference um, that we're a strong believer in is that you have to have standardization of everything you do, including standardized extubation support. You can't having you can't have people randomly extubating babies because a different faculty comes on, a different staff neonatologist is on, and part of standard of exhibition support is to think about the concept of ad trauma. We're very good as neonatologists understanding volume trauma, barotrauma, but I think we're not that good about avoiding ad trauma. So we want to avoid these babies falling apart when they're extubated. So we want to extubate them only when ready. Um, a 22-weeker cannot be treated like a 29-weeker. A 29-weeker might be ready at day one of life after surfactant. Um, a 22-weeker is not gonna be ready, even though you might think, oh, look, there are minimal vent settings, quote unquote. Um, they'll probably be more ready when they're actually seven weeks old. So their postmenstrual age is 29 weeks and one seven, because you want them to have a sustainable respiratory drive. You don't wanna be fighting huge amounts of central apnea and that's going to, the central apnea is going to lead to atelectra trauma and hypoxia leading to pulmonary hypertension. So we don't push them off. Um, again, this is not a 30 week, a 28 weeker, or 30 weeker, 31 weeker. These are 22, 23 weekers. Um, let's look at some, some data. And here's a paper from 2017. And you read deep into the paper. And you find this a fascinating fact that failed extubation in the first weeks of life, and in this population, now the population they study were actually older. This was 24 and zero sevenths to 27 and six sevenths. So failing in a population that's not, not even as young as 22 weeks and 23 weekers is significantly associated with increased death before discharge. 28% mortality versus 6% mortality. This is almost five-fold difference. We control 100% whether someone is electively extubated. So if we just avoid pushing these babies off in the first weeks of life, we've just reduced their chance of death by 500%. Um, there's not many things that we can do that can reduce death by 500%. So it's very uh, critical not to push them off. And of course, in this study, it was easy to predict who was gonna fail. The ones who failed were the 24-week babies. And the ones who failed were the 500 gram babies, not the 900 gram uh, 27 uh, weakers. And so it was very easy to know who's gonna fail. Um, and so knowing that you, that you can predict that, you should not be doing it. So the goal is to minimize multiple failure attempts. Now, it, it wasn't just mortality that went up in this paper, IVH rate went up, infection rates went up, actually severe BPD actually went up because when you're failing, you're usually developing that electrotrauma. And when you have to use much higher pressure that, that you were on than before, once those lungs are collapsed down, there's something known as the hysteresis curve. And it takes a lot more pressure to reinflate because you're going on the inspiratory limb of the curve than to maintain it. So once you fall off that hysteresis curve, you end up using a lot more pressure than you used before and starting to damage the alveolar epithelium as you reinflate and get capillary leak and inactivate your surfactant. So the goal is to minimize multiple failure attempts. So we do not push these kids off. Again, I'm talking 22 and 23, not, not an IUGR 26 weeker, not a vigorous 27 weeker, not even a vigorous 24 week. I'm talking 22 and 23 weekers. Now, when we extubate, um, we always go to non-invasive ventilation. We tend to use uh, NAVA currently for non-invasive ventilation. Um, but I think the key is any non-invasive ventilation is quite good. Usually most of these babies are over between 800 and 1,000 grams. Some might be a little bit bigger. And we follow this here, you know, let's go again, look at some more literature on this. So here's a, again, a great study by uh, Dr. Ramanathan, 
and a randomized control trial of nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation versus nasal CPAP, and showing that if you extubate to nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, you cut the rate of extubation failure in half, lowered the rate of clinical BPD, lowered the rate of physiologic BPD. So once again, it showed if you decrease extubation failure, you have much better outcome. What's a good way to decrease extubation failure? Go to non-invasive ventilation first, and then eventually transition to nasal CPAP once ventilation doesn't become an issue and once central apnea doesn't become an issue.